Okay, welcome to the panel portion of our queer cartography session. We're gonna be joined by two more additional panelists, um, Amber Boss and Lily Outman. Um, so I'm not gonna introduce the Jacks again. <laughs> you heard their bios, but I will introduce Amber and Lily, if that's okay. <laughs> So um, Dr. Amber Boss is a MAP therapist and research strategist through her consultancy MAP Boss Co, or MAP Boss Company. Amber helps community-engaged scholars integrate trauma-informed practices throughout their research and teaching. She lives with her partners in Alaskan Malamute in Provo, Utah, where she serves as a local organizer supporting LGBTQ plus folks who have recently left the Mormon church. Lily Outman is a second year master's student at Penn State, primarily studying mobile thematic map design and data journalism. They are also interested in queer, trans, and feminist applications of cartography in academic and industry settings. Lily enjoys tracking the lesbian bars they've been to on a map they made, including a they bar right here in Pittsburgh called Harold's Haunt. Is that where you went yesterday? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So um, my vision for this panel is that I'm going to ask a kickoff question, and ideally, I have to do a little work other than that. Um, if there's an awkward silence, I will fill it with another question. I'm going to save the last 10 minutes um, for you guys to ask questions about either presentations or anything that we talk about here today. Um, so the first, well, I'm, we're trying to get the closed captioning set up. Is it working? Yes, oh. it's working. <laughs> okay, so the first question, the kickoff question is for each panelist, feel free to pass around the mic, and it's how do you define queer cartography? And maybe we've heard some of that already, but broad question, I'm sure it's not an easy answer. So let's start with Amber. Wow, yeah, thank you folks. My answer to this question so I guess maybe I'd like to contextualize it with why I feel like I deserve space and, and, and a place in this conversation. Um, I live in Provo, Utah, which has the highest concentration of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormons. And there is a very interesting um, set of circumstances taking place in the queer community there. Uh, it's actually part of the reason I became more visibly queer upon moving there. I don't think most people understood I had any type of queer identity. It wasn't something that was a part of my professionalization. And uh, that's what's prompted me to kind of go and explore uh, issues of trauma within our work. I'll be talking about trauma-informed mapping at 4 o'clock today. And so I see queer cartography as suicide prevention. There are a number of folks within the, the Mormon community and the kind of intricacies of what it means to be visibly queer. And um, for context, Brigham Young University in 2020 removed language from their code of conduct that's um, penalized students for engaging in same-sex relationships. Uh, but then they continued to penalize folks for still being in same-sex relationships. They just removed it from their documentation. And so that means there's a lot of, um, you know, it, visibility is a very political uh, topic, especially now. And so I'm coming to this from a question of who gets the right to be visible, who gets the right to be mapped. Uh, and the, the modes through which that creates pathways to give folks an opportunity to see themselves and understand themselves differently. There are a lot of folks who did come out as queer throughout the pandemic. Maybe we're familiar with this kind of, uh, this wave of folks who were able to feel freer in their identities. And so, uh, but with that, understanding that queer data gives that visibility in a particular way. It also asks us to, um, again, consider questions around what we're doing with our maps that engage with queer data. I think one of the projects that I'm kind of working towards is understanding, or is maturing our capacities of understanding what our map portfolios should look like, and that not all of our data should be shared. I know we've been talking about this for a while, but kind of increasing the nuance and discernment that we're bringing to those conversations. So queer cartography as suicide prevention. 
Well, first, I just want to say, like, thank you to Lou for hosting this and to Lou and Travis for, like, organizing these DEI panels. Like, I really enjoyed the accessibility one, and I'm really excited to be uh, here for this one as well. Um, I think that maybe the way I approach queer cartography relates a little bit to, like, kind of thinking about how there are kind of a few like broad labels for people's various queer identities, but everyone's like individual experience with that within that is like very different. And so like throughout my life, like trying to figure out what labels exactly fit for me has been a challenge. And I think now I have reached more of a place of like just like vibes and also <laughs> like accepting that things may change as life continues. So I find it to be this like very individualized thing that for like simplicity, like we maybe do reduce down to labels sometimes, but um, everything is individualized. And I think that queer mapping is gonna be a very similar thing. It's different for every person. It's individualized and we might put them in these broad categories, but like each person's gonna get something different from it. Um, and I am often thinking about like, especially people in like more industry settings and how they might be able to, in their everyday job, whatever that might be, have spaces for queer cartography and, um, you know, just, yeah, like I think that there's really great academic conversations. Like I'm a grad student, I get to have all those conversations and obviously like anyone can engage in these kind of like theoretical conversations, but I think that it's like really interesting to make sure that everyone gets a chance for queer cartography. I think that also like I really want to emphasize like the chance for joy within queer cartography. I think that obviously like maps showing like where there's spaces that may be scary to go to are like really important and acknowledging like the really harmful, especially like anti-trans laws are really important, but I want to acknowledge joy within mapping and I also want queer cartography to be in conversation with other critical cartography. One thing that has fascinated me for like the past few years has been kind of like body mapping and like cuerpo territorial maps. And I am very interested in like what trans body mapping might be. Um, and especially like to do that in like a repeated setting and like have people like map changes and feelings about their body, I think would be really interesting, but also like acknowledging the individualized aspect of that. And I think that's another thing too, is like there can be maps for like broad public consumption. Like I do study news cartography mainly, which is a very broad audience, but I think that I wanna also have space for um, maps that may only be for like you and a few friends too. So I'll leave it there for now, but I'm excited to hear what everyone else has to say too and talk more. Wow, that was awesome. Um, I didn't, uh, say my definition, but I'll be succinct because I, I feel like I just got to say a lot, which is that I think queer mapping is the responsibility for everyone who is left off the map or who needs to be left off the map. Yeah. And I love your definitions. Uh, well, I have a 20 minute presentation uh, that I just <laughs> delivered that I'm happy to deliver again. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I really see it in terms, as I said in the presentation, of practice. Um, I, I think a lot back to my first time at NASIS, um, and <laughs> Bill is smiling at me <laughs> there. Bill will remember this conversation, but we were talking, uh, and I said, you know, I don't think I could call, really call myself a big C cartographer. I might call myself a little C cartographer. And what I meant by that is like, I don't make maps. My maps are kind of ugly, I'll be honest. I mean. I can keep working on them, but you know, it, it doesn't. It's all a setup for you to win the competition. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come with you. What, what? I think my master. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> I love that. But I, you know, it, uh, design doesn't come naturally to me. Other things in cartography do come naturally to me. Um, and I really feel like over the past couple of years, NASIS has made big strides. I've grown, I've become more confident, you know, whatnot. Um, but not to call out some of my colleagues who are here with me from Kentucky, but on the way up, we were talking about like, oh, well, I, like, I don't know if I'm a cartographer. Like, is this the right conference for me? And it's like, yes, it is. But there's, there, to me, that shows how there's still kind of these, these barriers around practice, around how we're building community that 
people are still kind of feeling like they can't, there, there's a barrier to entry um, that is higher than I think it actually needs to be. And it, maybe it's something in, in how we market ourselves or perceive ourselves. I don't really know, but that is what is kind of driving me for a querying of cartography and what I see it as. I just want to respond real fast. Like, am I a cartographer? Is like, am I a lesbian? Am I trans? Right? I think there's something to that about the power of it. Like, and, and am I enough? And the enoughness of what we do. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point, too. About the querying of cartography. It's a practice. It's the same, right? It does the same things. So I think that's Are really awesome. Enough? Are you a cartographer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you have another question well, for us? Yay. You guys have. Nope, I also just wrote down about the power of naming, and I just, mm, I think, mm. just another check mark, because it is really important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll just make a quick comment. Like, I came out during the pandemic, like, one of your talks alluded to, and I was living with Bill at the time, and we kept joking, like, I don't really have my gay card yet. So, like, and, like what, what does that mean? Or, like, how do I earn it? And it was, like, a lot of deep, deep uncertainty. But, like, sort of leaning into where this discussion just left off, like, you know, what, de what then does it like mean to queer or map or what then does it mean to like practice queer cartography? Like what are maybe like tangible practices of queering the map or queering cartography in and out of academia? Um, I will, maybe Lily's nodding her head a lot, maybe <laughs> we'll start there. Sure, well, I guess like I've had a lot of different thoughts about like some possible like practical applications of queering cartography and like one thing that I have been kind of thinking a lot about because people really talk about like big data a ton in like cartography and GIS circles and I am kind of imagining something in like the opposite direction of that. That being said like I think there's a lot of uses in like larger data sets in terms of like anonymizing like individual people and I think that's like really important in a lot of situations obviously and like yeah literally for safety because as we saw those like trans folks making maps of like trans health cl clinics is like really bad. But um, I'm kind of thinking about how like in terms of like telling, I'm gonna use the example of like telling stories about trans healthcare maybe to a broader public and trying to get the public to understand something like that. Maybe there's kind of like incomplete data sets about things like that. And first of all, I guess like at a basic point, I think that it would be good in more instances to use incomplete data sets as long as we begin to acknowledge like instances where there is incomplete data. Because like there are many cases where it is okay to just like not map something. But I think that also like these standards of like what is good enough data is like very like patriarchal. So I don't always agree with those as long as again there is that acknowledgement for issues with like data uh, certainty and things like that. That being said, I am really interested in like narratives and like individual narratives to possibly like tell broader stories about something like trans healthcare rather than like a big map that is like hard to relate to as an individual. And the reason I started thinking about this is because I started out in biological anthropology and like human evolution. And that is like a very different area. But when we think about like the fossil record for human evolution, there is really a lack of um, fossils. Like we just have bits and parts of different individuals, but there are like individuals that we get narratives around. And so like, if I say Australopithecus afarensis, like nobody knows what that means. But if I say Lucy, like people might know who Lucy is. She's kind of this like iconic figure um, and like kind of represents like some of this like past human evolution. So people really latch on to like this one narrative around Lucy, but they would just be like overwhelmed by just like seeing a bunch of like rib bones and stuff like that. Like that's hard to conceptualize the history of human evolution through a bunch of like pieces and data that's somewhat incomplete. But when we tie that narrative to like one individual and what she might have been doing in her environment, then that is like a more compelling story in the sense of like science communication and getting the public informed. And again, as we've said earlier, like not everything about queer mapping is for public consumption, but if we're trying to 
get more people to understand the issues with trans healthcare. And we tie that narrative to one person who maybe drives 20 minutes for their first HRT appointment. Their doctor really sucks, as is often the case. Then they drive 40 minutes for their next appointment. Then maybe they drive two hours to get top surgery. Like tracing this individual narrative in maybe a slightly mappy way might be a way to approach queer cartography and embracing like the fact that individuals can somewhat represent like a broader story and a broader data set rather than like having these like standards of like what a good data set should be, I think that would be an interesting possible avenue for queer cartography, but I'm also curious to hear what everyone else has to say, because there are a lot of avenues for queer cartography. Who wants to go next? Jeff. Yeah, I, I just want to follow up on that, because I think what you just described is very much in line with what Jack Giesking was talking about, like social network analysis, like is it a map in the sense that we traditionally see it? Is there a north arrow? No. Oh, it's not a map. No, you know. <laughs> but this idea that we can have different types of visualizations that are geographic in some sort of way, that are telling stories, that are um, we don't necessarily see them as they all they do fall under data visualizations, but we are opening the door up to what is what is and what can constitute a map. And so I think this is kind of gets to this perpetual uh, question in cartography of like, well, what is and isn't a map? Is this, is this right? Is this wrong? You know, it's like that, that to me is a, is a moot point um, it, it, because it's always going to change. And I think that, that what, what both of you have said is kind of saying like sometimes the map as we think about it and are trained to create is not actually what is best. And you know, acknowledge that and and bring in new practices. Um, uh, thank you. Like all of this is just so fun and smart. And I was thinking about um, like traveling stories of queer life are really important. There's like Finn Inky and Finding the Movement, which is about the '70s in Detroit, Minneapolis, and Madison writes about all the archives of lesbian queer life are about like a bar, but then if you talk to people, it's about how they got to the bar and what they did beforehand and where they, and then like I have three generations of people in, of lesbian queer New York who all ate at the same pizza place but didn't know it because it's just the shitty Rizzoli pizza number two, like that's how bad the pizza place, because it's cheap pizza and you're drunk and it's 2 a.m. and you don't care where you eat. And they're all eating the same place for like over 30 years, it's still there. Um, and I think these traveling stories remind me of Olivia Engel just graduated uh, with her PhD um, on geographies of abortion and abortion access in the UK, and these traveling stories of where you go and how you get, but also how you get medicine sent to you, like what travels to you. Um, and it's, it gets back to reproductive justice, which filters through everything that we're talking about here. Um, yeah, I just wanna, yeah. Yeah, kind of picking up. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I'm thinking about um, the ways that these students on Brigham Young University's campus relate to each other very much, these travel stories that Jack was just talking about, um, they're oral histories. Not a lot is recorded digitally, and that is a very strategic choice. Um, faculty members that have information or anything gesturing to allyship on their Instagram profiles have been recently targeted, right? And so there is a very high level of surveillance taking place. And so we, we're reverting back uh, to these, these more oral practices of being able to share what safe spaces are. And there's even covert um, kind of attempts to mark what safe spaces are in, in real life physical places. I'm not gonna mention what those techniques are, uh, but there are ways that students have developed to kind of create these constellations uh, across space uh, within Provo's um, kind of physical space. And then also taking the folks who do have the privilege to be visible, they are very much grounded within a, a very class-based privilege. Folks who are not as likely to be kicked out and experience um, you know, unhoused ex moments, but they're able to, they 
they have enough support from their families. So of course intersectionality is always important, but I think there is, I'm seeing this you know, up close and personal, the ways that uh, these different privileges. So going to Lily's point about a kind of the incomplete data sets, continuing to engage, and again, understanding the gaps and the silences as the areas that we're needing more care, we're meeting, needing more support, and we're needing to find ways um, to kind of traverse the, the silences and, and understanding the, the kind of um, fetishization of the digital data set is probably not going to serve us in these, in these really specific sensitive situations. One, like to give us like also because Lou specifically said give us a tangible example. So I thought I would show a tangible example. Oh, you did it. Okay, great. That's cool. And I can, sweet. Okay, cool. And I can go move the mouse somewhere over. Ah, yay. So um, this is LGBT map and what I love about it and thinking about it is they go into relationship, these are like breaking down all the laws and policies. So it's not like how many people are aware, right? So it's a really innovative way to think of like what, what does count, like what affects your life. Um, here are state non-discrimination laws and they're very policy oriented, religious extremption laws. But you could think about how many white supremacist uh, organizing events there were too. You can think about um, how many Christian nationalist preachers there are in the state, right? You can take things apart in different ways that we start thinking about mapping and categorizing and like the impact and the effect and, and the trauma that's affecting our life that isn't exactly written into something uh, like policy, um, but it's there affecting us all the time and how that trauma works. Um, maybe a little bit to Lily and Jack's presentation and points like this sense of making maps for your own community and maybe not to the public or also like breaking the mold even in a, in a more public way of like making a map that is in defiance of what we know as traditional cartography really makes me think about like punk art and I'm a big fan of punk like history art whatever and it's like this idea of do it yourself and keeping it internally, but also making like this thing that is so just fucking ugly, but somehow like becomes really cool and it's become really personal and it's a, a deep, deep expression of who in your community is without like any maybe external judgment. And to me, like like queering cartography can also be like just breaking the map for the sake of breaking the map. Maybe it doesn't even need a purpose. And I just wanted to say that little piece like queering cartography is punk. <laughs> um, but, um, I think this is a good segue for any audience questions. So if you have any questions, um, the mic cord is short. You're gonna have to like form a line <laughs> and then ask your question. <laughs> Not shocking, I have a question. Uh, hi, I'm Vanessa Knopko-Wetzel, she, her. Um, let me, I kept re-asking the question in different ways in my head to find, try to find the best way, um, but I'll just vomit it out. Um, so um, I've been involved at NASIS and volunteer capacities for a while. I've gone for like 11 years. Folks who know me, me know me as a loud person who's done <laughs> DI things. And recently uh, at the business lunch, there was a survey results that showed that some folks um, said that they felt that uh, NASIS was getting too political and that there, that there was too much DEI stuff in cartography. And while I understand that sentiment because there is discomfort around a lot of change and things that didn't exist before, I was wondering if you feel comfortable to, to share what it's like to be on the opposite side where you don't see yourselves in the maps and what that means, as well as how others can help in participating in queer cartography, both in mapping as well as helping to build support in community. This reminds me of Nat Fox's work, who um, just got a job for the state of Oregon uh, doing emergency preparedness uh, for marginalized people. Um, and uh, I did not know that the entire LGBTQ movement in Japan post tsunami became absolutely fixated on climate change. Um, because once the tsunami hit, 
uh, queer people were separated in their families, their families didn't count, trans people were not allowed to get the access to resources, um, hormones, bathrooms, name. Um, and uh, it was so heart-wrenching and heartbreaking and violent that the entire movement in Japan, the LGBT movement, is about climate change. And I think if we start from something that affects all of us, like authoritarianism, uh, climate change, um, artificial intelligence, uh, um, machine learning and how that's being used against us, and saying, okay, well, this is how it affects me. How does it affect you? We're in this together. I think that's uh, one way. Um, and I think these things are coming for us. Like it's. It's these kind of like, as my girlfriend always says, she got it from somewhere, the apocalypse starts with, oh, that's weird. And you know, huh, like we, we, I walked by a tree and all the green leaves had fallen off and we just stood at it and we're like, she's like, that's weird. I was like, oh, you've been saying that quote? She's like, oh God. And so, you know, and, and so I wonder, uh, and I think that if, if we start in the hardest things that are hitting us um, and, and talk openly about it and like masculinity is changing like white masculinity has no freaking idea what to do with itself, thank God. And because it wasn't working for them and they didn't know it, right? And um, uh, that needs to change a lot and there needs to be support and collaborative rethinking, um, asking people who, um, now that I've taken testosterone, I don't talk about my feelings all the time. I love to talk about my feelings. So um, just like how that access to words and sensation and affect shifts hormonally needs to be brought up more and allow different ways of thinking about that. Um, that's not, this is natural, but, uh, uh, and given different tools too. Um, yeah, so some thoughts. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the question, Vanessa. Uh, what I have written down is the dis redistribution of the discomfort. So when I'm coming to my work now from a, a trauma-informed capacity, we're thinking about window of tolerance. We're thinking about the, the, the muscles that we have to pull on that allow us to do difficult things. So when I'm talking about trauma-informed mapping, I'm not talking about doing anything differently within your visualization software. I'm talking about embody-based practices that make sure that you're staying within a place of safety and security for yourself and for the folks that you're going to be interacting with before, during, after producing that map. So there is a moment where I want to go, aha, now you feel it too. <laughs> and also, pushing people out of their window of tolerance is not radical. To be radical, Paulo Freire, we talk about him a lot when we're talking about the banking model of education. And when reading this, the moment that really stood out for me is that he has this call about it's the, the, the job of the oppressed to reintroduce the oppressors to their humanity. And so there's a big moment here. We, it's not fair. It's not the work that I want to be doing. And also, it is definitely part of the work to hold space for folks who have not typically experience discomfort, they're getting cues of danger. That's, I know that sounds perhaps um, you know, overly sensitized, but when we're, when we're feeling this moment, like there's something within our autonomic nervous systems that are cueing danger. And I think we're wanting to orient to safety for all of us. For, for we, to, to make the point that there is a livable future here for all of us and we're not gonna leave you behind. And so my response to that is, you're not gonna be left behind. Come along with me. Oh, oh I, I was gonna say something. <laughs> I'll, I'll, make it, I'll make it fast because I know you'll have a good question. So <laughs> um, I just wanted to respond to two things that Amber and Lily had said because I, I, I think you both hit the nail on the head here. Um, you know, it does take, I, I wrote this down, it takes time to be queer. Uh, it, it does, like, I, I think about, um, this is, you know, very kind of like a rational economics view of it, but like, you know, the time that I could have spent writing this talk, I could have spent like trying to make a map that looks beautiful, you know? <laughs> Even though I'm not sure if I, no, I can't do it. But, like, but you know, I, I need it all the time to, to make it look good. Um, you know, like like there are trade-offs that, that queer people and other minoritized populations have to make. Uh, and that's, you know, period. You know, like, like you don't need to talk about it more. Like there are trade-offs. Um, and I think I wanted to kind of speak to some, something Amber said about like, you know, uh, 
we're not trying to leave people behind. And, and I think that that's very fair. And I think if you feel like you're being left behind, it's because you're choosing to be left behind. Um, and I, I very much centered my talk and I, you know, I said this about how it could be, you know, seen as politically conservative to come back to cartography. But because I, I see, and what I was trying to show in that talk is that queerness is already here. It doesn't, you know, we can choose to ignore it if we want, but it's already embedded in our practice. So, so you, you're part of it, whether you acknowledge it or not. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is that I, I too kind of similarly found that at the business meeting, I, you know, it was off-putting, but the the um, you know the word on the street from what I hear is that that is a very very small number of respondents. And so I think that that is good. You know, in any event that that goes on, you know, you're always going to have some sort of naysayer or detractor. Um, and so I think you know the fact that it's not actually that's that significant of a number of people shows that we are making good progress. But of course, you know, as always, there's still more work to be done. Oh, sorry. Just th and that's how white supremacy works. Like you, you make yourself into the victim in Christian nationalism and Zionism, right? That who remains and that the victim is a static position and that you are alone and lonely. And that is also media that is produced to keep people in those places and to keep those movements going and to keep power and to um, destroy democracy. Cool. Um, I'll be quick, but I just wanted to thank you all. Uh, I wish I could have written down everything you were all saying. It was amazing. And if you know of resources to share, I don't know. I started posting stuff to this Slack channel, but maybe the DEI Slack channel. I don't know. I just I feel like I'm constantly refining resources, maps, things, books, things to read. So, um, I this is sort of based on a few things. I thought Amber, what you said about being um, taking time to be visibly queer. That was so, it's brave and it's amazing because as, uh, you know, a woman and a lesbian that completely looks like a cisgender heteronormative person, I've always thought about that. Um, and I'm always like, as I've grown more confident in myself and in my position and I have lots of, um, uh, I'm totally blanking on the word, but I live in like a position of power. I'm like, well, I want to be able to, you know, have myself be visible as an ally. So, um, but also just sort of bouncing off of what Lily said in Finding Joy, since we're s sort of wrapping up here and we got a little heavy, I was, uh, um, I thought it would be fun and I'm always curious of like what you find, where you find your joy in being queer or as a queer cartographer. I got lost on like lesbian TikTok during the pandemic and. I don't know if it's like, it, I think that would be really cool to do like social media analysis on because I'm like kind of in this weird range. I don't know what Tumblr is and I'm like, do I have to get on Tumblr to hang out with the cool kids? I don't know. Um, can you tell I'm 40? Yeah, like I'm like, what's cool? This is going to be our last question, but a fantastic question to end on. So like, where do you find your joy? Does anyone else want to go? <laughs> okay, all right, okay, perfect, perfect. Um, I, I really find my joy in queer cartography from the historical things um, through, which is unsurprising if you know me. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've, con you know, kind of through collecting queer maps. Um, I, I've talked to older queer cartographers and whatnot, and it's just, um, in some ways, it's awe-inspiring to to hear these stories and to hear. Um, oftentimes, I, I, f I find that they're really excited that somebody wants to talk to them about their experiences. And because of that, I, you know, I, f I, I oftentimes get off the phone with them and I spend 45 minutes writing down what I have heard. And, and you know, I, I don't know, maybe I need to throw those things out because I haven't asked for permission, you know, like, like, like there's, a, there's a politics to that. But I, but I feel like I'm being entrusted with knowledge that is very geographic, very spatial, you know, things about practices that I had no clue about, that I have never seen anything about, um, that just, it, it's just amazing to me. Um, I also follow the, um, oh, well, actually, this would be kind of depressing, so I, I'm, I'm going to move on. <laughs> Hi. Um, where's my joy? I think it's in, in, Ta-da, social networks. I think maybe I didn't even realize it because trans, like the trans maps are, 
they're sad AF. So trying to find other ways of, wow, look how amazing we are, look how connected we are. Um, and I think that's what I did in queer mapping when I thought about this concept of constellations. I was like, how do you turn that frown upside down? Like, what what are we actually doing? See all the work, it's amazing, you're, you're incredible. Like, you lived again, that's, that's incredible. And there's a little bit of healing. Um, yeah, and I think something also that is changing that I find joyful is multi-generational queer connection is becoming acceptable. And I think like something, I, it was at first the movie Carol, like this cross-generational lesbian dating, which gay men have, cis gay men have always had. But um, I think something else has changed with this refusal of the pedophile narrative. Like we're like, actually, no, we don't believe you. We have data. Um, and this is a good use of data. Yay. You know, like, um, you know, you have projected this onto us the idea of the groomer, the anti the more the anti-trans laws go up with the idea of groomers, the more there's a kind of like cross-generational acceptance for saying that's actually never been true. And so I think there's a, a kind of healing happening there that I think is really beautiful in connection. So my answer I think is kind of in the opposite direction of Jack Swab in that it's kind of like younger people and like the future of what queer cartography might be really brings me joy. My lab recently had a like kind of like lab kickoff thing because we're a pretty new cartography lab at Penn State and I had my lesbian bar map hanging in the lab and there was these two freshmen who had come to the talk and one in particular was really really interested in my lesbian bar map. She had, or she was starting out as a ge geoscience major, but I think we can get her over to geography. Um, <laughs> and she was just like amazed that, like, within this like somewhat scientific realm, that someone could make a map that is like so personal um, to their own experience. And you know, she hasn't read any theory yet. She hasn't taken a cartography class yet. So she basically has unlimited possibilities of like what she could make. She's not held down by any previous standards. So just seeing that passion and that joy in younger people and what they might be able to bring to cartography is what really brings me joy. Yeah, great. Um, there's like a capacity that queer folks have to clock each other, even if there's not uh, any like really discernible cues. And so I get the most joy when, when I've been clocked and then there's a person who comes up, like goes out of their way and just lets me know about, you know, their new girlfriend that they have. <laughs> and it's just so delightful. And I've gotten, you know, notes under my doorstep thanking me for my pride flags. And, and so there's these moments, um, kind of like the besides and slantwise moments of, of that, that connection and that celebration, especially in the face of all the heaviness, uh, that, that really, there's a vibrancy to it that really is not comparable to much else. So, so much joy there. All right, y'all, let's give it up for our speakers.